Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know what time it is with you. We are in uh, quarantined at home, and uh, so our sense of time is a little bit uh, distorted. Our lecture today is on uh, a very interesting uh, subject, uh, colonialism. The author is a Sudanese um, Arab author called Tayyib Saleh. And the title of the book is Season of Migration to the North. So this is the book. And if you have uh, the Arabic, it will be called Mawsim al-Hijra ila shimal A Season of Migration to the North. Now, um, usually, of course, uh, migrations are uh, sometimes permanent. Sometimes they are seasonal. Seasonal ones usually could be for studying, could be for uh, work, could be for uh, escape temporary of a situation. But um, uh, usually people go and come back. Uh, for Tayyib al-Saleh, who is uh, uh, Sudanese, he went to university to study in England. And he worked in the BBC, in the Arabic program. And uh, uh, when he wrote this book, uh, it was highly critical of the Sudanese uh, government and regime, the post-colonial also. And uh, for a while he was forbidden to return to Sudan, but then eventually he went back. He died a couple of years ago. I remember him personally. He came and he gave us a lecture in AUB in the 80s. And uh, it was interesting that when he gave the lecture and we asked him questions about the book and interpretations, he said, oh, you have seen in my book more things than I have put in them. So in fact, uh, again, like a Rorschach test, we readers look into a text and see more sometimes than what the author has put in. The, uh, the North uh, and the South uh, in this text are a little bit what we would call East and West in our culture. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, if you have a little bit of uh, idea of history and geography, uh, by the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the, 18th, uh, of the 20th century, most of the Arab world was carved under different uh, rules. The British took um, Egypt, Sudan, Palestine, and Iraq as mandates, you know. The French took Lebanon, Syria, and North Africa, Algeria, Tunis, and, and Morocco. Uh, the Italians took Ethiopia. The Belgians took part of Africa. Uh, and, and so forth, the, 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 most of the wealthy countries and the continents were uh, taken by, by these um, uh, European countries. And of course, uh, we have here, uh, you know, uh, in the mid uh, 20th century, we had these independence movements, independence against the French, and like Fran uh, 1943 was Lebanon, uh, Algeria, and other countries also revolted against the French. And uh, some of them, of course, uh, the, the story of Palestine was tragic because uh, when the British left, they, they established the state of Israel. And this was, this was um, uh, you know, one of the uh, ongoing uh, miseries and injustices of the Arab world till today. Uh, however, how did this colonialism impact people is very interesting. And how did it affect, again, uh, the first generation, the second generation, the third generation, going a little bit to Ibn Khaldun's three generations, if you remember. Uh, here in this book, uh, he is trying, uh, Tayyip Saleh, to show us that the people who were the first generation of the, of the, of the colonial occupation, how were they affected? And then how does the second generation take it more mildly? And maybe by the third generation, uh, most of the people go and study in London uh, and in fact go shopping in London, you know. And he has a very interesting uh, paragraph, which is uh, uh, 
uh, criticizing this. Uh, 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 he has written many books, and one of them was made into a film, Ars uh, Zain. And uh, this book has been translated into many, many languages. Uh, he, for him, of course, Sudan is Africa, but Sudan is also Arab, Sudan is also Islamic, Sudan is black, Sudan is hot, Sudan is the south, it is the Nile equator, desert, traditions, corruption, and the victim uh, character that we see mostly in occupied countries. The North is, for him in this book, England. England is cold, white, and in his uh, book, he says, uh, the first page, the country where even the fish died from the cold. It was, it was so cold. It's the country of technology, of innovation, of industrial revolution. Uh, it has education. This is where people go and study. It's a country where there is permissiveness versus the traditional uh, approach, especially with women. Uh, women are very conservative in Sudan. And then um, uh, when, when the narrator comes back, uh, and I'll tell you more about the narrator, uh, people ask him questions. Is it true that people dance with you, women and men dance in public together? I mean, is this possible, this permissiveness? He considers them a little bit naive, especially the girls, that he can always impress them with stories of Africa. And then they are the aggressors. While uh, the we is the south, the they is the north. Now, who are the characters of this book? There is a narrator who is unnamed. And one of the big problems of our not being able to meet is that you have no access to the book. If you can find a way to read the book, uh, it would be great, whether it's in Arabic or in English. I'm going to try and see if I find a good link PDF in, in, in one of the um, uh, websites. But if you have anybody who has a book who can lend it to you and you can read it, because this is a book that needs to be read from cover to cover. And we have three, four sessions for it, so it will take time. I will do you all the guidelines, but at the end, you need to have this intimate relationship with the book. So there is the narrator who is unnamed. Uh, the story starts with this narrator who comes back from uh, London after spending seven years studying English poetry in uh, England. And uh, he comes to this village. And in fact, uh, there is this kind of irony whereby the moment he comes back, very much like somebody who comes uh, in Lebanon from the Daya and everybody goes to, um, uh, uh, to the airport to bring him, you know. Khabar uh, now, tell us what's happening. How is this? How is that? How is this? How is that? And he starts telling them that, you know, uh, he missed home. He missed his grandfather, he missed his house, he missed everything that was Sudan. But the, the, the British are, you know, many of them are like us. Uh, they are not different. Uh, they do things differently, but you know, people all over the world are the same. Now, as he comes back to this village, he, he uh, at some time realizes that there's a newcomer to the village whom he doesn't know. And he asks uh, his, his family, who is this man? They say, oh, he just moved recently. His name is Mustafa Saeed. Uh, and Mustafa Saeed is, interestingly, an agricultural person who is coming in this village to give agricultural consultation. He has a wife, Husna, and he has two children. And as, as the story unfolds, uh, we find that one evening when they are both sitting together, and uh, talking to each other, he suddenly, uh, and having a little bit of, you know, drinks, uh, he suddenly realized that Mustafa Said speaks perfect English, recites poetry in English, and therefore there is another side to this person uh, that is uh, not what we see 
eventually in, 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 in the appearance of the village. Now, the story is very interesting because in the first 50 pages of the book, then Mustafa Sahid disappears. He goes swimming in the Nile and he never comes back. So is he drowned? Is he, you know, that Tayyib uh, Saleh says the Nile flows from south to north. So if somebody goes to the river, will he go north? Uh, this is one of the uh, questions that are sort of pending in this, in this story. Uh, so gradually, we, uh, in the, just before uh, he disappears, he tells uh, the narrator his story. And he tells him how he was uh, uh, raised without a father, that uh, his mother uh, raised him, and that uh, uh, one day he decided to go to school because uh, it was, he went to school and he started studying there. He was brilliant, he had a brilliant mind. At some point, the teacher said, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, this, this village is not enough for you. We have to send you somewhere to study. So they sent him to Cairo. And while he was studying in Cairo, again, he became very well um, uh, speaking English and they called him the black Englishman. And, um, and then from then on, he needed to go to higher education and they told him there's only either you can go to Beirut or you can go to London, and eventually he chooses to go to London. Now, once he reaches London, this man, who is extremely brilliant, this Mustafa Saeed, starts a campaign in England, which is a little bit maybe a reversal of what the British did to the Sudan. If the British came and occupied Sudan, he wants to go to England and occupy England. But there's only one way he can occupy England. And that is, since he's not a soldier, either with his brain or with his sexual activities. In other words, he thinks that every time he sleeps with a British pure virgin girl, he has liberated uh, Sudan or, or he has liberated, uh, you know, the Arab world. So he starts... If the British came to Sudan to hunt, he is going to England to do hunting. And who are the preys? These highly sophisticated, they're not prostitutes on the streets, they are extremely sophisticated, highly uh, aristocratic British girls that he tries to pursue. And every time he captures one, he thinks that he has succeeded in his hunting. And these girls fall for, for him. You know, he says, nisa like the flies, they, they, they stick on me. However, there seems to be a problem with these girls. Every time one of them uh, sleeps with, with uh, Mustafa Saeed, uh, after a while she either commits suicide or she can't face herself anymore or she finds that she is extremely disappointed or he has fooled her. And he thinks, you know, this is, this is his ongoing war. As a student, he's extremely brilliant. His top. In fact, uh, we will find later that he has even become a, an economist who writes books on economics. And then there is this fantastic meeting with one woman called Jean Morris. Jean Morris, he pursues her and she doesn't fall for him. It becomes a Tom and Jerry fight. And as this goes on, uh, you know, uh, it becomes for him a challenge. Uh, she keeps on insulting him and tell him, you black, black, African, dirty, ugly, you know, whatever, until eventually um, uh, she agrees to marry him. And they, and as uh, they are making love, you know, uh, there are quite interesting scenes of um, sexual in intercourses, uh, he kills her with a knife. And he, uh, he takes, they take her to, he ta they, he's taken to, he's arrested. And he spends seven years in jail. But then they acquit him because they say, Haram, this uh, African was not ready for our civilization. Uh, we couldn't civilize him. We couldn't educate him. And therefore, uh, they acquit him. And he comes back to Sudan. So there is all this chapter of this life in England that is totally 
unaware of in the village of Sudan. But then after he disappears, we discover more about this person. We discover that uh, this person, uh, uh, for instance, after he dies or he disappears, he leaves a letter to the narrator and gives him a key to his house with a room in it. And when he goes to visit this room, he finds that this man has a perfect British room in his Sudanese village. A room with chimney, with British chairs, and a library full of English books, with at least six, seven books written by him on economics, on the rape of Africa, and on other texts, which we will discuss in detail. So he left the south, he went to the north. He could not succeed in the north. He came back to the south and he left the south again. He disappeared. The south is the village. There is his wife. There is this uh, sort of uh, stability. The north is, is, is Europe, is technology and so forth. Now, as, as uh, uh, we discuss a little bit this colonialism, since we will go through this in details more, with, uh, we will find that uh, when he describes himself, he says, I'm a rubber ball. Wherever you throw me, I bounce. Whereas when the narrator speaks, he says, I have roots. And when we compare these two characters, we find that Mustafa Saeed never had really true roots in Sudan. And therefore, for him, it was easier to live anywhere else. Whereas those who have roots and identity and stability in the place are always firmer and come back to their villages. So we will, we will discuss more of these things when we do the readings. However, I want to raise here an issue that has been very much part of our Arab culture. There has always been three approaches in the Arab world since the mandates and independence and until modern times. One approach is that the West or the North uh, uh, or the mandates or the imperialists or the occupiers are the devil, are evil, uh, uh, that all the evil comes from them. They are like Ahriman, you know, uh, in, in the Zoroastrian religion. Whatever is evil comes from them. And therefore, anything which is Western is to be condemned and not accepted. So you put a complete blackout on whatever is West or North. The other approach is the total love affair with the North or the West. Uh, like in Lebanon, uh, France is Emm al Hanoun, and whatever France does is excellent. And you know this, this uh, you know, or America is excellent, and whatever is technology, whatever is new, we import. We always like the senior clothes because they are Western, uh, frangy brangy, you know, this sort of local things are. And this approach is the total opposite politically of the first approach. Then there is the third approach, which many countries and many cultures have adopted. Take from whatever is from the West that is good and keep whatever which is in the East which is good. In other words, keep your traditions that are valuable, keep your culture which is valuable, but at the same time, take the technology, take the electricity, take these innovations, take the, and then try to make a, a merge between them. Now, in this third group, many of the people have a bit of a schizophrenic type of a character. In other words, if we belong to this third group, who are we as an identity? Are we a, a mixture of East and West? Do we wear Western clothes, but we have conservative traditions? Do we have double standards? We will see a lot of this with our next reading with Balakian when he says, he talks about being an Armenian American and how these two worlds come together in the house in the kitchen, in the food, and so forth. Uh, we also will discuss a little bit on colonialism. 
And as we discuss colonialism, we see a little bit what the English have done in, 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 in Sudan. Uh, they have always been this condescending approach towards the locals. And uh, they are also the ones who brought the arms, the guns. They pretended they're coming here to give us bread, but in fact, they created in us the germ of violence. And then, somewhere in the book also, there is the post-colonial locals who have taken over after the British have left, who have become worse than the British. And he says, at least the others, the foreigners, we got rid of them. They went back home. What shall we do with the locals who have turned out to be worse than the foreigners? Where shall we send them? What shall we do with them? And a very good criticism of this is the educational conference that we shall discuss and refer to uh, in our discussions. Another chapter that we would like to discuss in this book is the role of women. How are the women in the West? How are the women in the East? In the East or in the North, in the, in the, in the Sudan, there is Husna, who is the wife and the child. There is the old lady, Bint Majzoub, who has passed the fourth flag, if you want to, of Apple. And therefore, she is like men. She sits together, she smokes with them, she spits, she curses, you know. So there is no sexual intonations. And of course, there's the picture of the European woman. Some of the discussion themes, which I have posted on our last uh, uh, PowerPoint, is the theme of North versus South, the attitude of the Europeans towards the natives, the liberation from colonialism, did we really get rid of the colonial system? How are women treated in Sudan? Uh, is this a casual flight or is it a migration? What is the role of the city? And uh, other themes that will come as we go on. So these are just guidelines that I'm giving you today. As we start reading the book, I'll go back to the PowerPoint and take slide by slide and discuss them with reference to the pages. But this is just a launch, an introduction to Tayyip Saleh's season of migration to the north. Thank you.